ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار وبعد all praises due to allah we laud him we praise him in him we beseech and seek assistance and help and in him we seek forgiveness and we seek the refuge with allah the creator of the heavens and the earth from the mischievousness of our souls and the wrong results and actions of our deeds whoever allah the creator of the heavens and the earth guides no one can lead him astray and whoever allah the sublime and the mighty leads to be left astray no one will be able to guide them and i publicly without any coercion without any force or compulsion bear witness that there is nothing worthy of worship except allah and i bear witness that muhammad who died 1416 years ago in the desert of arabia is his messenger his final messenger the seal of all prophets and the seal of all the revelations that allah sent to all the prophets before him as to what follows the best speech is the book of allah and the best guidance is the guidance of that man named muhammad of whom we should all be wanting to know about and the worst of all things in this life are novelties or newly invented issues into our religion for every newly invented issue in our religion is an accursed and wretched innovation and every single innovation is a going astray and every going astray is in the hell fire assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah <clears throat> after thanking allah subhanahu wa ta'ala i i then thank you for inviting me here to Camden New Jersey to speak uh, on the subject of which unfortunately i myself wasn't clear in uh, the uh, the actual intent of the subject until i just asked the brother just a couple of minutes ago and i asked him is it okay if i um change the subject a little bit uh because the subject is um why do we take shahada and what is the meaning of the shahada and i asked the brother can i change the the meaning of it to why why should you be a muslim why should you be a muslim um but unfortunately from what i see in front of me it seems as though um these words may be wasted because it seems as though the majority of the people here are already muslim um but for those of you who are non muslim whatever religion you may be or whatever religion that you used to be and you don't ascribe to anymore then i'd like to appeal to you uh on this subject why should you be a muslim and uh firstly before we uh begin and try our best not to bore you i'd like to say that i think i'm qualified and i'm not qualified to talk about a whole lot of subjects i can only maybe think of maybe one or two subjects that i think i'm qualified to talk about and this may be one of them one of the reasons why i think i'm qualified to talk about why you should be a muslim is because at one time in my life i wasn't a muslim so i think 
after living both lives, I think I have some qualifications on why a person, whether they're black, whether they're white, no matter what color their skin may be, no matter what texture of hair they may have, no matter what language they may speak, I think I'm qualified to say on this subject, why should you be a Muslim? First of all, I'd like to um, mention some things that maybe people think is Islam. We're going to try to dispel some of the misnomers, the misnomers and the misconceptions that we have here in the society, this American society, on what is Islam by mentioning what isn't Islam. And it's interesting, for those of you who are non-Muslims, and maybe some of the Muslims here may not even know it, that the most misunderstood religion in the world, and at the same time the most despised and rejected religion in the world, is Islam. For those of you who don't know. At the same time, this misunderstood way of life and this despised and rejected and held in contempt religion called Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world. And this is not the words of me. This is the words of non-Muslims. Non-Muslims. They have statistics that they are claiming that are accurate, and we believe that they're more accurate than what they say, that Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world, and it's the fastest growing religion in the United States. In fact, <clears throat> to make a note of why it's despised, or one of the points of uh, statements the why it's despised, about four or five years ago, maybe longer than that, uh, President, the former President Nixon, mentioned on national TV, on national TV, not in some park somewhere or in his blue room or green room when he was in the White House, but he said this on national television, that now that we've done or we're about to do away with communism, now we have to concentrate on the biggest threat that we have to this nation. And that's not the drugs, that's not prostitution, that's not inflation. That's not maternal mortality rate. It's land. It's on national TV, documented, that the biggest threat to this society, according to the former President Nixon, is Islam. And according to Dan Rather and Mike Wallace, just two years ago, on 60 Minutes, the fastest growing religion in the United States is Islam without any advertising, without any national television shows, without any national radio program, without any billboards like the Christians and the Jews and the other religions have, without any major, major advertising in any of the newspapers. Islam is the fastest growing religion in the United States and in the world, they added to this. And Mike Wallace said, <coughs> that by the year 2300, they estimate that one out of every three people in the entire country is going to be a Muslim. Already, one out of every four people are Muslim. Four billion people in the world. One billion people are Muslim. Four billion people, one billion are Muslim. By the year 2300, according to a non-Muslim, one out of every three people in this country is going to be a Muslim. Now for the Muslim, we already knew this. We already knew that Islam was going to grow like this. In addition to this, out of all the prison systems in the United States, federal prisons, state prisons, county prisons, local or city prisons and city jails, the fastest growing religion in the prison system in the United States right now is the religion of Islam. In the armed forces, the fastest growing religion in the Navy, in the Marines, even in the Coast Guard, the Army, in the Air Force, documented by the non-Muslims is Islam. What is the reason? Why are so many people becoming Muslims? Why that when just two years ago, 
all around that time when this Gulf War broke out? Why did over 8,000 members of the, of the uh, American troops, why did over 8,000 members of the American troops while they were stationed in Saudi Arabia accept Islam and become Muslim? 35% of them were white, 16% of them were women. And they also have some statistics that Islam is the fastest growing religion among women today. More women are accepting Islam now than any other religion in the United States. Why is this happening? Why are people becoming Muslim? Why are people accepting Islam? There's a lot of reasons. There's a lot of reasons. But one of the reasons, as when a Protestant chaplain, a Reverend Bogosian, one day when we were driving to work, I used to work as a chaplain, quote unquote, in New York State Corrections, and we used to carpool. And I had an office with the Jewish chaplain and the Catholic chaplain and the Protestant chaplain. The Protestant chaplain one day, Reverend Bogosian, he asked me, he said, Daoud, why did you leave Christianity? Because he also knew that I was in the Christian ministry. I used to be in the Christian ministry in the Christian church, in the Pentecostal church. I was on my way to go to the seminary to become a minister. He said, why did you leave Christianity and accept this land? And I told him, I said, there were at least two or three reasons. But the main reason was, it wasn't because of the oppression of black people and the white people had their foots on the black people's necks and all those other reasons that people always give for accepting Islam or some other silly reasons or not so silly reasons. I told him there was basically two or three reasons. And one of the reasons was that I just had this problem of understanding the Trinity and accepting the Trinity as a philosophy, for lack of a better word, or a concept that made sense. I told him as we were driving, we were riding, he was riding my car, I said, it doesn't seem right for me as a creature of the creator of the heavens and the earth to worship, even though I was pushing this in the church, to worship a creator who's going to make something as a religious way of life have some confusion in it. It just didn't seem right that the creator of the heavens and earth would have some ambiguities or some vagary, some confusion or cloudiness around the basic principles of that religion. And I said one of those basic principles was the Trinity. I just couldn't understand why the basic principles of Christianity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, there wasn't one verse in the Bible that substantiated it. And I was a student. I wasn't just a layman on the street. I was a student, and he knew because he, was a, he had a doctor of divinity, so he knew better than I did, that there wasn't one verse in this Bible, 66 books in the Protestant version, 73 books in the Catholic version, no matter what Bible you read, Wycliffe, Schofield, Lane, New World Translation, the Mormon Bible, the Seventh-day Adventist Bible, didn't make any difference. Not one verse that was of the original manuscript that proved that God was three. Not one. That was an original part of the text of the Bible. And so he looked over to me. He's a much older man than me. He said, you know, one of our female ministers, she gave a very beautiful explanation on this. And this, his answer on the, the explanation of the Trinity was one of the reasons why I can sit and tell you why you should be a Muslim. He said to me, she explained this thing very beautifully. She said that Christian, the concept of the Trinitarian doctrine is like an egg. You see, Daoud, the egg has three parts. It has the shell, it has the yolk, and it has the white. And all of that makes up the egg. He said, isn't that beautiful? I said, yes, it's very beautiful. And especially because I like eggs. I said, but that theory, that theory doesn't hold water, Reverend Bogosian. He said, why? I said, because you know just like I know. And by this time, we're riding through the beautiful mountains of upstate New York. I'm trying to look at the road and look at him at the same time. I said, you know as well as I do, Reverend Bogosian, that there's no verse in the Bible that can substantiate this. And number two, that the basic doctrine of Christianity is that the Father, 
the Son, and the Holy Ghost are all equal. They're all equal, and they all coexist at the same time. When one is there, the other two are there also. And when the second one is there, the third and the first one is there also. And when the second is there, the third is there, the first is there, when the first is there, the third and the second is there, etc. Not only do they coexist or do are they co-equal, but if one were to leave, quote unquote, then the other two have to leave also because of their coexistence and their co-eternality. I said, secondly, if you were to take that white from that egg, you don't have an egg anymore because all you have left is the shell and the yolk. You don't have a complete egg. And if you take away the shell, you just have the yolk and the white. And if you take away the yolk, you just have the white and the shell. That egg is not complete. So if you're saying to me, Reverend Bogosian, that when the father sent the son, and the son supposedly was crucified, and he died on the cross, you're telling me, Reverend Bogosian, that the father and the Holy Ghost also died. And if you're not telling me that, then they're not co-equal and they don't coexist. And you know, brothers and sisters in Islam and dear guests, Reverend Bogosian had another answer. He replied to me. He said, Daoud, we just have to believe in it. We just have to believe in it. And I told him, I said, yes. And this is the thing that I fought with up until my 14th birthday in the junior ministry in the church. That here I am pushing this concept that I learned from my dear mother and that she learned from her dear mother and that she learned from her dear mother. And when I asked my mother, exactly what Allah says in the Quran وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمُ اتَّبِعُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ قَالُوا مَنْ لَتَّبِعُوا مَا أَلْفَيْنَا عَلَيْنِ آبَاءَنَا Why, when you are said to, when said to them, why don't you follow that which was revealed from your Lord? They say to you, they will say, we follow what our fathers follow. When they ask, why don't you follow that which was revealed? Not with some man added to it, but why don't you follow? Why don't you accept? Why don't you adhere to that which the Creator revealed? They say, no, we follow that which our fathers follow. And this is what I asked when I asked my mother. I said, Mom, why do you believe Jesus is the Son of God after showing her all the proof? She said, because that's what my father and my mother taught me. You see, the reason why a person becomes a Muslim are various reasons. Some people accept Islam because they think that this is a religion of black people. Until they find out that there are millions of white Muslims all throughout the world. Millions of white Muslims. Some people accept Islam because they view Islam like a gang and they want protection, especially some brothers who are locked up, they accept Islam in the prison system. They think Islam is like some hard rock crew, so they accept Islam so they don't get pounced on. Some people accept Islam because they believe that this way of life takes you out of being oppressed. Some people accept Islam because they want to get married to a Muslim and they know that if they're going to get that man or get that woman, they have to be a Muslim, which is not true. Now we'd like to discuss why should you be a Muslim? Number one, this word Muslim is an active participle grammatically. It means one who submits themselves to the will of the creator of the heavens and the earth. And I keep pointing up for a reason that we'll come to, inshallah. If it's the will of Allah, the Creator, will come to the reason why I keep pointing up when I'm addressing him. A Muslim is one who submits to the will lovingly, lovingly, willfully, intentionally, without any compulsion. They submit their entire soul to the will of the Creator of the heavens and the earth, Allah. And this word, Muslim denotes 
that that person now has become a slave. So when a person invites a non-Muslim, like some of you, to Islam, he or she is actually inviting you not to just become a Muslim, they're, they're inviting you to become a slave. But a slave to whom? A slave to the creator of the heavens and the earth. If you look at all the other religions, and there are many, many religions in the world, there's Taoism, there's Confucianism, there's Jainism, there's Christianity with so many hundreds, maybe thousands of denominations, there's Judaism with a couple of hundreds or few denominations. When you look at the name of the individual, when you look at the name of the individual or the name of their religion, every single one has its origin either in a place, like a town or a village, or some event that happened in history, or it's named after some person. The only religion in the world that the person who practices that religion is connected to the creator of the heavens and earth is Islam. Islam means to submit yourself to the will of Allah. But the title Christian, the title Jew, the title Hindu, the title Buddhist is connected to some human being. The origin of that word is connected to some human being. That Allah himself created that human being. Or it's connected to some town, or some place, some village, or some tribe, or something like this. Christians call themselves Christians because Jesus is the Christ. And Muslims believe that Jesus is the Christ. We believe this. And some people don't know that we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, born in the Immaculate Conception, and that he was sinless. Jews, they have this name because of Judah, because of a tribe. Hindus have the word Hindu, their name, because of that affiliation. And Buddhists, because of Buddha. And we can go on and on, Confucianism, etc. But Muslims and Islam have their name and title of their religion because they're connected to the one who they submit to, who is Allah. They submit to the will of the Creator and they make themselves slaves to the one who created Jesus, the one who created Moses, the one who created Abraham and Muhammad and the rest of them, and everything that you can see and you can't see. So why should you be a Muslim? You should be a Muslim is because the Creator of the heavens and the earth says in the Quran, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنْسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I did not create the jinn, which is a certain kind of creature that he created that we can't see, or the human being, except for one reason, the Creator says, except to worship me. Islam is the only religion, the Muslims are the only people that realize that the reason why they were created is not to win the playoffs, these games, these basketball games. Not to be a basketball player. Allah didn't create us to be nuclear physicists. Allah didn't create us to be carpenters. Allah didn't create us to be plumbers, or beauticians, or sanitation workers, or taxi cab drivers. Allah didn't create the human being to waste his time using drugs or selling their bodies on the street. Allah didn't create the human being to, to worship things that he created. I'll say that again. Allah didn't create the human being to worship something that he created. He created the human being to worship him who created him. This by itself, dear listeners, is the reason why you should be a Muslim. When you become a Muslim, you are returning to the reason why you created. If you were to ask the average person, dear non-Muslim listeners, ask yourself right now, those of you who are non-Muslim, why was I created? Just think about it. I'll stop for a minute. Think about the reason that you probably give if I ask you this question one-on-one. -on -one. Why were you created, Sally, or Harry, or Leroy, or whatever your name may be? Why were you created? I guarantee you, you're going to come up with some reason that's connected to this life, and it's not going to help you in the next life. I guarantee you. Whatever the reason you think you're created, it's going to stop at the grave. It's not going to help you in the next life. Oh, I was created to be a good person. I was created to help my fellow man. 
I was created to be a scientist, whatever. But the reason why you were created is so that you can worship your Lord. And worshiping your Lord is something that you don't have the choice of doing. You see, it would be unimaginable, non-Muslim listeners, it would be unimaginable for an employer to employ you and let you work in his business and run that business any way you want. Who that has a good business sense and their right mind is going to allow you to work in their business, you get hired from McDonald's. And they're going to allow you to represent, wear the cap and the uniform of Burger King. This is unthinkable. The creator of the heavens and the earth is going to create you. He's going to create me and every human being that he created. And he's going to lead you to worship him the way you want to worship him. It doesn't make sense. So the detailed program of how we are to submit to him and worship him is called Islam. Because every single way of life or religion leaves that person to pick and choose how they want to worship the Creator. Even though they have a book, the Jews have a Talmud in the, in the so-called Torah, the Christians have the Bible, the Hindus have their book. But if you look inside these scriptures, or those things that they call the scriptures, you'll find that there are statements of human beings and you'll find their statements of not just human beings, you'll find that their statements that will lead a person to destruction in this life and the next. That goes against the very nature of the human being. For instance, for instance, if you're smacked on the cheek, you turn the other cheek. This goes against the very nature of animals, let alone a human being. The very nature of an animal is that if you strike it, it's going to either defend itself by spraying some spray like a skunk or the porcupines that will shoot out, those spikes will shoot out, those things will shoot out at you, or if it's a lion, you're really in bad shape, or a pit bull or something like this. The human being is created that if you smack him, the natural reaction is to defend himself. Now here's something that we're saying is from the creator of the heavens and the earth, somebody breaks in your house, Somebody waits me a while for bed, your wife, and you turn the other cheek and say, no, here, take, oh, you took my television, here's my refrigerator, here's my washing machine, and if you want my wife again, may Allah forbid you can have her again. Islam shows the human being exactly how they can live their lives. Have you ever heard of a religion that for every single act, there's a prayer? I've never, and I'm not boasting, I'm not here to boast, but I've read a lot about a lot of different religions in detail, in detail. Probably some religions that some of you have never even heard of, like the religion of the people in Australia, the Aborigines in the jungles of Australia, who worship a god called Atnatu. Have you ever heard of a religion, a way of life that has a prayer for every single act? A prayer that keeps you mindful of the, keeps you mindful of the Creator. Always calling on the Creator. For the Muslim, he has a prayer for putting on his clothes. She has a prayer for taking off our clothes. We have a prayer when we look in the mirror. We have a prayer when we go to the bathroom. We have a prayer when we come out of the bathroom. We have a prayer when we get in a car, in a boat, in a plane. We have a prayer when we put on our shoes. We have a prayer when we get on a horse. We have a prayer when we get a new job. We have a prayer when we go to the shopping mall. There's a prayer that you're saying before you go into the shopping mall. There's a prayer even when the Muslim is getting ready to have sexual intercourse with their legal, their legal wife or husband. There's a prayer. There's a prayer when the baby comes out the mother's womb. There's a prayer for everything. So the person who's a Muslim, who becomes a Muslim, why should you be a Muslim? Just for this one aspect alone. They're constantly constantly, constantly calling on their Lord. Constantly, 24-7. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, before you go to bed, when you get in the bed, 
you wipe the bed off, you say a prayer for that. When you wake up, there's another prayer. When you wash up, there's another prayer. And this now may seem like this is very, very restrictive, or this may seem like extremism, but what type of religion is going to connect you to the Creator like that? What kind of religion does this? And at the same time, you can be a police officer. At the same time, you can be a fireman. At the same time, you can still be a musician. But you're never disconnected with your Lord. You don't go to the mosque on one day and then all the other six days you do something else. You don't go to the church on one day and all the other days you do something else. The Creator is always connected to you, figuratively speaking, because of the way that the religion of Islam is set up. The way it's set up. The political system, the social system, the economic system is set up in a way that you are always constantly worshiping your Lord. But the real benefit of becoming a Muslim, and this may shock some of the people who are non-Muslims here, and I have to say it. I have to say it. And those of you who know me from the past, you know I say some things that are kind of controversial. I have to say that by you come, becoming a Muslim, you will receive salvation. Now all the other religions say this also. Accept Christianity, accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, believe in the vicarious blood atonement, believe that he died for your sins, and he rose on the third day from the sepulchre, you will have salvation. Or whatever other religion. So Islam, y'all, you, you Muslims are no different. Or you Muslims are no different. No, but we're telling you that you, if you become a Muslim, you will receive salvation. Why? For two basic reasons. The first reason is, is that, would you like to gamble with your soul? Do you actually believe that the Creator put you on this earth and that you won't stand in front of Him and answer to Him for what you did? Whether you live 20 years, 40 years, 60 years, you're going to have to stand in front of Him. Now, would you rather stand in front of something that He created knowing that you did the good things of this life that he commanded you? Or would you like to stand in front of him? Do you think, do you think that you will be left alone this thing that you won't believe and you, that you believe and you won't be tested and that you won't have to stand in front of him? If this is true in your chest, that you believe that you're going to stand in front of the creator of the heavens and earth, and then maybe, may Allah forbid, this feeling may fall on us and we may all die. Do you feel safe that you live the life that he, the creator of the heavens and the earth, told you to live? Do you feel safe that you'll be able to get away with doing whatever you did and saying that someone else died for my sin? Do you actually believe that? If you feel safe that someone else who didn't commit the sin, but you drank all the Johnny Walker Reds, and you smoked all the reefer, and you committed all the fornication, and things worse than that, and there are things worse than that, you actually think, or you believe, or would you like to gamble with your soul, that you can safely say that you'll stand in front of the creator of the heavens and the earth, that you'll stand in front of the creator of the heavens and the earth, and be able to say to him, I worshiped you in the way that I felt best, Please forgive me and grant me your paradise. And he'll grant you his paradise based on your good intentions. I'd like to tell you that the answer is you're wrong. You're wrong. Because Allah, the Most High, has explained to us in the Quran. Whoever seeks a religion other than Islam, it will never be accepted from him. And in the last day, he'll be the loser. The second reason, the second reason is that each and every human being, every human being that Allah created, every single human being that Allah created, they have what we call a time span. Everything has a time span on this planet. Everything. 
the flies, the mosquitoes, the flowers, the birds, whatever. And you and I have a time span also. And we don't know when we're going to die. And within that time span, there are some things that we have to do. In order for us to find out what we have to do, we have to go back to the creator of the heavens and earth to find out what is that thing that we have to do. Now I'd like to ask a question. This is a rhetorical question that we won't, that we won't, inshallah, that we won't, inshallah, attack you with. I'd like to ask a question, but I don't want you to answer if you're non-Muslim. I'd like you to answer it in your mind. How many of you in your mind, and you raise the hand in your mind, how many of you thought that Islam was this stuff that you hear Mir Farrakhan talking about? How many of you thought that Islam was this stuff that the five percenters are talking about? How many of you thought that Islam was what the Morris American Science Temple, I don't know if they had that down here, but the Morris American Science Temple, Noble Ali people, was Islam? How many of you thought that that stuff that you see in Iran that Khomeini used to be about was Islam? Probably some of you would say, yes, in my mind, you would raise your hand in your mind, you would say, oh yeah, I just thought Farrakhan's group was another sect of Muslims. What I'm here to tell you, we're here to tell you today, that this isn't Islam. That Islam is not wearing a bow tie and selling bean pies. That Islam is not having your wife walk behind you five or ten paces. That Islam is not Saddam Hussein or Muhammad Qaddafi. That Islam is not blowing up the World Trade Center. That Islam is not any of those things that people, out of their ignorance or intentionally, try to make Islam seem it is. Islam is the natural way of life that every single human being has to accept and follow. And if they follow Islam, if they accept Islam, if you become a Muslim, then you will receive salvation. You will receive the most greatest of rewards, which is to see the face of your Lord, Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, the glorified and exalted is to receive the greatest of rewards, to drink drinks that you never thought existed, to eat fruit that you never knew existed, to never ever grow old, to never have diseases, that when you sweat in paradise, the perspiration smells like perfume, and you get better and better and better. And yes, for those of you who are thinking about being married and things like this, yes, there's marriage in Paris. And not only is there marriage, but we won't get into that. I won't, I won't get into that. But there's so many things that we can mention for you, the benefit. Not just the next life, but in this life, Islam brings order to your life. Because I'm going to tell you, and you may not like it, those of you who are not Muslim. And I'm not saying this to ridicule you, to diss you. I'm telling you because it's the truth, because I'm a, I was a Muslim, I was a non-Muslim. Islam brings order to your life. And if you're not a Muslim, your life has confusion. Now, what's my proof? What's my proof? How is this guy going to come all the way from North New Jersey or come down the hill and tell us we're confused? Who do you think he is? I'm telling you, if you're not a Muslim, you've got confusion in your life. What's my proof? My proof is, is that if you're not connected to the creator of the heavens and the earth and you are worshiping him the way he ordered you to worship him, if you're not worshiping him the way he ordered you to worship him, and worshiping him alone, without going to some intermediary, or some intercessor, calling on some human being, or some rock, or some stone, and I don't think anybody here is going to be worshiping any stone, or no rock, or no trees, but some of us are doing even worse than that, we're worshiping human beings. If you are not calling on him, and worshiping him, in a manner that is befitting him, in the manner that he himself says to worship him, then you have to have confusion in your life. How can you say you don't have confusion in your life, even if you're the CEO of IBM, if you believe in three gods? How can you say you don't have confusion? If there was two gods or more, it'd have to be confusion in the universe. How much more a person that worships three gods? Just 
think about it. You got a God over here that says, I'm going, to, I'm going to make it snow today. You have a God over here that says, no, I'm going to make it rain today. Which one is going to make it rain and which one is going to make it snow? There's going to be confusion. If you don't want to create the heavens and earth by himself, alone by himself, there's no way you're going to tell me that you don't have confusion. Number one, you eat whatever you want to eat. You didn't even find out about the creator who created you and gave you this food before you were born. All these fruits and vegetables, all these fish and animals were already here before you came out of your mother's womb. And now you have the audacity. Now that you're not crawling anymore and drinking from your mother's breast milk, you have the audacity now that you become strong and adult-like to wear what you want to wear and eat what you want to eat and sleep with whoever you want to sleep with and you say this is not confusion? How can you, get, how can you say this is not confusion? How can you say this is not disorder? But for the Muslim, the Muslim obeys the Creator in everything. We wear what he says we should wear. We eat what he says we should eat. We sleep with whom he says we should sleep with. There's order in the Muslim's life. In every single thing that we do. Look at the social system of Islam. And look at the social system of the United States of America. And the social system of the United States of America, and I don't have to tell you about it, you already know about it. Let's take the, social, the, social, the, the welfare system. You know and I know, even though you're getting some benefit, a few crumbs from it, and I'm saying a few crumbs, this system stinks. It stinks, and you know it. And that's why there's so many social welfare reform programs. Look at the social system of Islam. And this social system can be used in any place, any time. If you took the social system, the social welfare system of the United States, it won't work in England, and it won't work in Australia, and it'll never work in Denmark or Finland. It only works in the United States. But the social system of Islam works anywhere in the world, at any time, any place. The Muslims are commanded to give 2.5% of their money at the end of the year to the poor. You see, in Islam, the money circulates like this. In the Western system, the money goes from the, from the bottom upward. It goes from the poor to the rich in an upward motion. And anyone who studies economics, you know this is a fact. In the Western world, the social economic system, the money goes from the poor over to the rich. And, the, and for the trickle-down theory, it just comes a little bit back down to the poor. But in Islam, the social system has it that everybody gets a piece and the person is commanded, commanded when they have wealth to give to the poor. And if they don't give to the poor, not like in America, I don't have to give my money. I could be banked up $50 million in the bank. And nobody's going to force me to, to take care of these poor people. I don't have to give them a dime. But in Islam, when the Muslim mayor or governor sends that authority out to your house at the end of the year, you want to give that money up to the poor. Or what happens? It may sound barbaric, you're going to be jailed. Because the poor have to be taken care of. They have to be taken care of. Look at the political system in Islam. And this system, democracy is the way. And we know, as they claim, we know as they claim, that this system is for the people and by the people. And the people, to use the common term, can push up, they think, they think, can push up on the president and change things. Or push up on the senator or the congressman and change things. But how does that person come into office? And what is the moral character of that person? For instance, the politician, he may give you something on this side of the table, but the same person that you helped get that politician into office, he's also helping the homosexuals over here. See, it's like a double-edged sword. In Islam, the politician, not only does he or she have to be moral, but that person also has to use the law of Allah. They can't use something from Aristotle. They can't use the Magna Carta. They can't use the Constitution of the United States that was put together and we all know.
Muslim Association or Boy Love or Man Love, whatever it is, where you can actually buy a magazine here in the United States and you can buy children as young as 18 months old up to 14 years of age, where you can actually buy or rent a child that has sexual intercourse with them. And some of the people who are making legislation in this country are members of that organization. Islam is a perfect way of life. In every single facet of that life, Allah is always first. So this is another reason why we should be Muslim. Because, because it connects us with the creator of the heavens and the earth, and it brings order to our lives. Now, I don't want to belabor this talk. I don't want to bore anybody any more than I've already bored them. But I'd like to tell you one more thing on why you should become a Muslim, which is the opposite of the first thing I mentioned. If you don't accept this land, if you don't believe and accept and bear witness that there's nothing worthy of worship as a deity except Allah, Allah is not a man. He's not black, he's not white, he's not a spirit. He's not a man. Allah is the creator of men. Allah is the creator of black. Allah is the creator of white. Allah is the creator of spirit. He's the creator of everything. If you don't accept the religion of Islam and don't bear witness that there's nothing worthy of worship, Jesus, Moses, Muhammad are out of the picture. Only one creator is worthy of worship with no partner. If you don't accept this before you die, then you will have a chastisement that is unlike any chastisement that you've ever, that you, you can't even imagine. Unlike anything that you can imagine. And I am, I am compelled to tell you this. Now, once again, that's what the Christians say. If you don't accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, then you're going to burn in hell. So I'm here to tell you that there's a big difference. The difference is, dear listeners, is that if this was true, if this is true, that we have to believe that there's someone else that's going to die for our sins, that there's someone else that died for the sins of all human beings, for sins that he himself didn't commit, if this is the case, then we are going to be doomed before we even go to the next life. And why is that? For one simple reason. No soul shall bear the burden of another. No soul shall bear the burden of another. And in your Bible, it says, the iniquities of the father will not be on the, the sin of the father will not be on the son, and the iniquities of the son will not be on the father. As a man sows, so shall he reap. This is what it says in the Bible. So how could it be that Adam committed a sin, someone thousands of years after him who didn't commit the sin, thousands of years after him, is going to die for the sins of Adam, not only Adam, and because of Adam, every human being has a black spot on their heart, and they're sinners by birth. Now some other human being that had nothing to do with this whatsoever is going to succumb and die for the people who committed sin. It doesn't make sense. So we're telling you that your salvation in this life and your salvation in the next life is that you have to worship the creator of the heavens and the earth by himself. You can't put any partners with him. You have to worship him alone. If you do this, you will receive the paradise that he has promised. And if you don't do this, you will receive an abasing, abasing chastisement and that chastisement will last for an eternity. It won't be for a few days. It won't be for a few weeks or a few months or a few years. That punishment will last forever. Now, I'd like to ask you once again, how many of you who are non-Muslims, don't raise your hand, the hand in your mind and in your heart, how many of you really think that you have it made and you like to gamble your soul? Put your soul on the table as the stake. These are the stakes. You know, like in Las Vegas, put all your chips up there. This is my soul. I'm absolutely sure that I have to 
have someone else to go between me and the Creator in order to receive my salvation, and I'm ready to die on that. How many of you are absolutely sure? If you think about it, I don't think you are. How many of you are absolutely sure that you are doing exactly what He wants you to do? And how many of you are absolutely sure that you're not going to walk out of this room and don't get hit by a car? Or don't get hit by a stray bullet? Or some face that somebody's trying to lift up to the roof or some moon falls on your head? Or whatever, heart attack. Are you absolutely sure? Do you know when you're going to die? So we're asking you, for those of you who thought that Islam was that black stuff that Farrakhan kind is of talking about, and for those of you who thought that Islam was whatever people think is Islam, other than what we said today, for those of you who now know what is Islam and why you should be a Muslim, we'd like to ask you, not in front of everybody, we'd like to ask you to accept this way of life that the Creator has ordered you, has prepared for you to live, and that you come into the fold of Islam and become a Muslim. Become a Muslim like so many of the people, like Mike Wallace said on 50 Minutes, are doing today in America. And I'd like to tell you something in my final words. That the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, who is the one who the book that Allah sent, the last revelation, after the, the book of Moses and the books of Jesus and the books of Abraham and David and all the other prophets, the Qur'an, after he sent those books, he sent the Qur'an as the final revelation. This Prophet Muhammad, who is the best example for all human beings, he told us that Islam is going to spread as far as night and day, and there's not going to be a house that Allah is going to leave except Islam is going to go into that house. So you won't be able to get away from it. There's going to come a time, grandmothers listening to my voice, mothers, fathers that listen to my voice, there's going to come a time, it's going to be inevitable. If you don't accept Islam, somebody in your family is going to accept Islam. Your children, your grandchildren, your nieces, your uncles, your aunts, somebody in your family is going to accept this man. And you're going to be hearing, if it will, if it's the will of Allah, the same message may be better than what you heard today. You're not going to be able to get away from this Islam. It's going to go into every single house, whether it's a desert house or a city house. So we're asking you to come back to the natural way of life to come back to the way that you were created is to submit yourself willfully, lovingly, without any compulsion to the will of the Creator of the heavens and the earth who is above the heavens. He's not everywhere. He's not in this water. He's not in this microphone. He's not in my heart. He's not in your heart. We don't carry the, the Creator of the heavens and of the earth around with us. He's above the heavens that He created in a manner that is befitting His majesty. We ask you to accept this way of life the way of life of Moses, the way of life of Jesus, the way of life of Abraham, all the prophets of Islam. This is what we ask you today. And these and other reasons that we haven't mentioned are the reasons why you should be a Muslim. And don't delay it saying, oh, well, you know, I got a little time, you know, I'm thinking about becoming a Muslim, but, you know, I just can't stop smoking cigarettes. That's your excuse? That's no excuse. Accept this now and then work on stop smoking cigarettes. I just like girls. I just got to have some girls. I, I mean, I just, I got to have a girlfriend. Okay, we know it's a sin to have a girlfriend. Accept this land. Allah will forgive you of your sins. And we'll work on that. I, I, I just love gambling. I can't say this. If once I can get rid of this gambling, I'll become a Muslim. Accept this land. Allah will forgive you of your sins, and we'll work on the gambling issue. Don't use these petty excuses and these vices as an excuse. It's better for you to come into a slam right now, foot dragging and half stepping, than to go out those doors right now, full stepping, get hit by a cookie truck, and die in the state of non-Islam. It's better for you. It's better for you to accept this man. So in conclusion, i like to say that those of you who are Muslim, we have the duty to spread this word. Continue to spread this word of Islam and don't let anything deter you from spreading this word of Islam. 
For those of you who are in Rutgers University, whatever college or high school you go to or Muslim, whatever job you work on, don't be afraid of inviting people to Islam. Don't ever be afraid of talking about Allah and the beautiful benefits that he's going to give us in this life and in the next. For those of you who are non-Muslim, even though you may not have understood what I said, even though you may not agree with what I said, at least, at least, consider Islam. Consider some of the things that I said. And at most, before you leave this room, you don't have to have some water sprinkled on your head to become a Muslim. You don't have to get this big pool of water and you be dumped into this pool of water. You don't have to turn the lights out, put a rope around or a handkerchief around your eyes and be initiated by being beat down. All you have to do to become a Muslim, you have to fill out a form to spend some cash, $500 to become a Muslim, get your, your, your yearly annual membership. All you have to do is to say these words. I bear witness that there is nothing worthy of worship except the one and true living creator, Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad, not Elijah Muhammad, not Billy Muhammad down the street with the bow ties, that Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, 1400 years ago, is the finality of prophets and messengers. If you say this, we don't care what you did before you came into this room. You could be on the planet 60 years, 70 years, 80 years. We don't care what sin you committed. You're going to be forgiven for every single thing that you did. And you know what you did. And you know what you've been doing. If you say these words, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. I bear witness that there is nothing worthy of worship except Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. All your sins are forgiven. The tall ones, the short ones, the black ones, the white ones, the intentional ones, the unintentional ones, everything you've ever done in your life, you're forgiven for it. I don't care bank robbery, homosexuality, whatever you did, your slate will be clean. Clean, and you will be just like the day you came out of your mother's womb if you say those words. And you will join the brotherhood of one billion fastly growing people in the world called the Muslims. And lastly, you will receive salvation. You will see that which no eye, eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard, and the heart of a human being could ever even, or the mind of a human being could ever even imagine. You will receive things that he has promised us in this Quran. So, I thank you once again for inviting me here. I pray that Allah, He opens your heart to Islam. He allows you to come into the fold of Islam. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make all of you who are Muslims strong in the effort of bringing people to Islam and to loosen the knot in your tongue and make the people understand you and make your task easy for you. And I pray that you who are non-Muslim, like myself who was a non-Muslim, come into the fold of Islam before the day that you have to stand in front of your Lord. The day which is a dreadful day. A day which we won't be able to make any more excuses. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين أجمعين في كل مكان سبحانك اللهم وحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك anything that I said that is correct is from Allah and anything that I said that is incorrect is from myself والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله We have some questions here. <coughs> uh, who are the Ansar Allah? The Ansar Allah. I don't know how to spell it, but I want to know what this is about. Well, it really doesn't make any difference if you didn't know how to spell it or not, because 
uh, spelling it correctly or incorrectly um, uh, is more worthy than what they're about. The Ansarullah are a group of deviant, a group of fanatics, a group of stark raven out of their mind individuals. And they're not Muslim. I repeat, they are not Muslim. And let me tell you, um, uh, non Muslims who are listening, it is a very serious thing for a Muslim to say that another Muslim is not a Muslim. It's very serious. This is a major sin in Islam to call a Muslim a non-Muslim once he's a Muslim. I'm telling you that the Ansar Allah are not Muslim. But there are people who are misleading people, making people think that they're Muslim. If you want some details about them, then I would suggest, number one, <clears throat> that you go to some classes with the real Muslims, learn what Islam is about, and then you'll know that those individuals are not Muslims. Please address for the non-Muslims the hijab. The hijab has become a fashion statement. <laughs> Many non-Muslims that are ignorant of Islam think that wearing the hijab and openly engaging in haram behavior is okay. Because, please emphasize that, that because someone might be dressed like a Muslim and the behavior is un-Islamic. Also, many of these people engaged in this behavior will say it's okay because Allah knows what is in my heart. Also, please tell them they should find out what Islam is and what Islam isn't. Yes, absolutely. The back of the note, they should find out what Islam is and what Islam isn't. If they find out what Islam is, then they'll know what isn't Islam, for sure. As for the, um, the hijab, the hijab is the way you see the women dressed. This is called hijab. And we don't want to get into detail on why the Muslim woman wears this. We don't want to get into detail. Because it's not that important. What's important is for you to know who is your creator. Because if you don't know who your creator is, even if you're dressed like that, it's not going to be worth that much. For those women who are not dressed like these women, and you know who your creator is, for that aspect, you'll be better off than the woman who's dressed like this. Knowing why a Muslim woman dresses like this is not important. First, you should find out who is the one who told her to dress like this. Once you find out who he is, then it'll be easy to understand why he told, why he told him to dress like that. And Allah knows better. As for the Muslims who act un-Islamic, Allah says in the Qur'an, don't ask about them, ask about yourself. Don't ask about them. They are going to be questioned about what they did, and you are going to be questioned about what you do. We're human beings. We make mistakes. We commit sins. But for the Muslims who behave properly, who do what Allah says to do, and what the Prophet Muhammad says to do, then this is a good example of what we should look at. And that's the most important thing. As for the Muslims who do other than that, may Allah guide them and forgive them of all of their sins and all of it. I have been a Muslim for many years. Someone told me that because I did not take Shahada publicly, I was not a Muslim. Please explain, is this true? If so, would you ask all the Muslims to take their Shahada today so I will not be singled out? <laughs> That's pretty good, I like that one. Well, if you didn't take your Shahada publicly, taking Shahada for the non-Muslims, I'll explain it. Taking Shahada means what I just asked you to do, to say, I bear witness that there is nothing worthy of worship as a deed except Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, that's called taking your shahada, meaning you become a Muslim. Once you say that, you become a Muslim. That means taking your shahada. <clears throat> the Muslim, does, the person who accepts Islam does not have to take their shahada publicly. That's number one. They don't, number two, they don't have to say it in front of witnesses. A Muslim doesn't have to go out Call up Sister Fatima on the phone. Come on over, Sister Fatima. Uh, Gail is going to take us to Hada. And you can be waiting for, for Fatima to come over. Gail died. What's going to happen to her? Oh, she had a good intention. No. No. Taking your shahada is very simple. You're standing on the corner waiting for the bus. 
person comes up to you, you're a woman, even if it's a man, you try to be as modest as you can, he says, I'm interested in Islam, I think I'm ready. You tell him, repeat after me. I bear witness that there's nothing worthy of worship as a deed except Allah. I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Say it to him in Arabic first and then in English. If he says it after you, he's a Muslim. You don't need no witness. Alright? Can you discuss the beauty and blessings you receive when Muslim women cover? We'll save that one. Inshallah. Come back to that one. My first time hearing this is Allah is not a spirit. If Allah is not a spirit, then what is He? If you can't see Allah, if He is not omnipresent, then where is He? Just only above the heavens? This is a very, very good question. And I hope, and it may be, but I hope this is not from a Muslim. But if it is from a Muslim, no problem, because a lot of Muslims don't know this, that Allah is not a spirit and that Allah is above the heavens. In the Islamic belief system, most the correct belief is to believe that Allah is above the heavens. Allah says in the Quran, أَأَمِنْتُمْ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاءِ أَنْ يَخْسِفَ بِكُمُ الْأَرْضَ فَإِذَا هِيَا تَمُورُ Do you have any sense of security from the one who is above the heavens that he won't make the earth swallow you up and convulse on you? Do you have any sense of security from the one who is above the heavens. And another verse in the Quran, Allah says, Ar-Rahmanu ala al The beneficent one, Allah is above his throne, which is above the heavens. The correct belief in Islam, which is unlike any other belief in the world. There's no other religion in the world that believes this, except the Muslim. And I'm, I'm absolutely convinced and absolutely, whatever, sure, I'm absolutely sure that there's no other religion in the world that believes in God the way we do. And I hate to use the word God, Allah. We're the only religious people in the world that believe that the Creator is above the heavens and He's not everywhere. For the Muslim, we do not believe that Allah is everywhere. Because if you believe that Allah, God, the Creator, is everywhere, then you have divided Him up. And, number two, if you say that Allah, the Creator, is everywhere, then you have to be saying that He's in everything. I'll say it again. This may be the click in your mouth. If you say that Allah, the Creator, is everywhere, then He has to be in everything. You can't be everywhere and not be in everything. How can you? Think about it. In order to be everywhere, you have to be in everything. And if you say that Allah, the Creator, your God, my God, is everywhere, meaning that He's in everything, do you know what you're saying? You're saying that Allah is in human buttocks. I'm going to say it like this. You're saying that Allah is in feces. You're saying that the Creator is in those sewer holes out there. You're saying that every time one of those people out in the street takes a blast on some crack, they're smoking Allah. They're smoking Allah. Every time a person urinates, they're urinating the Creator of the heavens out of their organs. That's what you're saying when you say Allah is everywhere. Because if He's everywhere, He has to be in everything. So you mean to tell me when your child comes out of your womb, Allah came out? Because He's everywhere. You see how silly this is? This doesn't even gel with the, with the, 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 the most illogical man. This is past being illogical. No, the Creator is above His creation, but He's everywhere by His hearing, by His vision, by His power, by His knowledge. He sees everything, and His vision is everywhere. He knows everything, and His knowledge is everywhere. He hears everything, and his hearing is everywhere. And his power is over everything, everywhere. But he himself is above the heavens in a manner that is befitting his sublimity, his magnificence, and his, and, and his uh, uh, tremendousness. He is over the heavens in a manner that is befitting his majesty. And he is not a spirit, because if he was a spirit, then he would be created. 
If Allah was a spirit, he would be created because spirits are created. Allah is not created, he is the creator. And everything else is created. Just think about it. If you say Allah is a spirit, a spirit had a beginning and a spirit has an end. Just like a tree has a beginning and a tree has an end. The stars have a beginning and they're definitely going to fizzle out. The scientists are saying it. The sun is the greatest star in the sky. Star in the sky is definitely fizzling out right now. This is a proven fact. So if you're saying that Allah is a spirit, he, a spirit is just one of those things that he created. Now you're saying he has a beginning. And if he has a beginning, like those who believe that Jesus is God, if he has a beginning, he has to have an end. There's no way you can say something has a beginning and it doesn't have an end. There's no way you can get around it. So this is why we say Allah is not everywhere, he's not in you, he's not in me, he's above the heavens as he says he is, and he's not a spirit because spirits are created. <coughs> oh, they're reminding me that the Ansar group that we talked about uh, earlier have denounced Islam. They now are called Native American Hebrews. I don't think they're called Native American Hebrews. I think they're called the Nubian Hebrews. Uh, the Nubian Hebrew, Hebrew Islamic Mission. Now, Native, Native American Hebrew. No, they call the Nubian Hebrew. Right. Anyway, it doesn't make any difference. There's still some Ansars that are hanging around. Okay. If we have girlfriends before or after we became Muslim, if they aren't showing any signs of accepting Islam, should we try to give them da'wah or leave them alone? Giving somebody dawah means invite them to Islam for those non-Muslims who don't know. If we have girlfriends or boyfriends before we came Muslims, this question seems as though you still have contact with your old girlfriend. Is, is, that, is that what you're saying? I hope you're not saying that. But if you do have contact, I mean if you both you work together, you still work, I know, you still work together. If you still have contact with your old girlfriend before you became a Muslim or your old boyfriend before you became a Muslim, then you should direct your old girlfriend to the Muslim sisters, and you should direct your old boyfriend to the Muslim brothers. So the brothers can talk to him, and the sisters can talk to her, but you yourself shouldn't talk to them. Because if they were your old girlfriend or boyfriend, you know, you may see him get a little thing there in your heart, and you know, Satan is real, you know. Uh, you said that we should become Muslim and that Islam has no confusion. Well. If one is not a Muslim, how do we differentiate Islam from the nation of Islam when they say they are Muslims too? What is the difference? There are people in the United States and around the world, around the Western world, men who get sex changes. There are men in America that get their... Got it. Oh. I don't know. There are, there are men that get their testicles. Oh, man. There are men who get their testicles removed and they go to the doctor and get hormone shots and get breasts. And they think and say that they are women. Just because he did that, does that make him a woman just because he said he's a woman? So just because somebody says they're a Muslim, that makes them a Muslim? Huh? No. There's some criteria to be a Muslim. Number one, we have to believe in Allah. When a person is a Muslim, he believes in Allah. Okay? Uh, Louis the Liar, Mr. Farrakhan, he says he's a Muslim too. Right? Okay. He says that he believes in Allah. I believe in Allah, he believes in Allah. But how do I believe in Allah, and how does he believe in Allah? The Muslims, those one billion people that we mentioned in the beginning, we believe that Allah is the creator of everything. He's not black, he's not white, he's not a man, he's not a woman, he's not the trees, he's not the stars, etc. The nation of Islam, they believe that Allah was born in the year, in the 18th century, excuse me, the 19th century. Yes, the 19th century. They believe that Allah, the creator who created you, me, everything, that Allah was born. His father was black, named Alfonso, and his mother was a white lady named Baby G. They got together in the hills of Europe, in some caves, from the hills and caves sides of Europe, 
back in the 1800s, and out came a half-white, slick hand looking man named Master Farah Muhammad, and he's Allah. That's what Farrakhan teaches. That's one of the main differences, that's one of the main differences between us and them. Alright? We believe in angels. We believe, the real Muslims, we believe that angels are created by Allah and they help the human being, they do work for Allah and they help the human being. Some of them move the clouds, they move, they make the rain come down because by Allah's permission. They uh, help, they uh, form the baby in the womb of the mother, gives it shape and gives it color by Allah's power, and they do a lot of other things for the human being. Farquhar's group, the Nation of Islam, they believe that angels are all black. Right? The real Muslims believe in the Qur'an. And that's a final revelation for all human beings. And that you don't look to any other book except the Qur'an. And the example of the Prophet Muhammad. Farrakhan's group uses the Bible, the Qur'an, and some other thing I forgot. Some other books. Fall of America, uh, Our Savior Has Arrived, How to Eat, number, uh, Volume 1 and Number 2. This is what they believe in. The real Muslims believe that after you die, Allah is going to take your dust. Your body deteriorates. He's going to take that dust, make it back into bones, put flesh back on it. You're going to stand up in front of him and answer for everything that you did, all the cash that you earned, where you earned it, and how you earned it, and where you spent it, and a whole lot of other things. You're going to be judged. Farrakhan's group says, no, that's spooky. Don't believe in that. The real thing is that when we die, that's it. That is over the they say. All right? And that the real paradise is getting some of this earth that we can call our own and getting rid of the white folks who's the devil. That's Farrakhan's proof. That there's no life after death. Is that enough differences right there? We believe that the devil is created by Allah and we can't see him that he whispers to the human being to do evil. They believe that the white man is a devil. And there's no good in the white man. All of them are devils, even the ones that are not even born yet. You see a white pregnant woman, she's a devil, and that baby that didn't come out of her womb yet is a devil too. That's what Farrakhan believes. And there's a whole lot of other things they believe. We pray five times a day, facing towards Mecca, in the manner that Allah misses in the Quran. They pray the way Elijah Muhammad taught them to pray. Standing like this, with holding their hands up like this. With their red bow ties on, facing some direction, I don't know. Chicago, someplace like that, I don't know. We believe, we believe that Muhammad is the final messenger of Allah. 1400 years ago. They believe that Elijah Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. There's a lot of differences. In, in short, they are not a sect of Muslims. They are not Muslims. I repeat, they are not Muslims. They are not Muslims. And I would rather eat with a Jew or a Christian than to eat with them at the table. They're the enemies of Muslims. Is it good, and we have to pray a few minutes to type our prayer, is it good for a sister to become Muslim from the attraction of the conduct of a Muslim man and how far should he go in helping? Well, we already answered how far he should go. He should send her to the masjid and let the sisters talk to her. But as far as her accepting Islam because of some attraction she has for um, a Muslim man, well, we're human beings. We're going to be attracted to each other. I mean, you can't get rid of that. But if she accepts Islam for that reason, I'm not going to say that she, her Islam won't be accepted by Allah. I don't have the ability to say, to say that. But I will say that, that she should reevaluate what Islam is about and her purpose in life, and she should reevaluate why she wants to accept Islam. How is it that if one became Muslim, his or her life will be better when you have Muslims who do worse things than non-Muslims? Please explain. Because if that Muslim who's committing sins dies, he's going to go to paradise because he believes in Allah and his messenger. The person who seemingly does all these good deeds, but they don't accept Islam and die, they're going to the hellfire forever. Yes. I 
absolutely. If Allah chooses, if Allah chooses, He will punish that Muslim. All non-Muslims will go to hell. I have to say it, I have to say it. All non-Muslims will go to hell, some Muslims will go to hell. All Muslims will go to paradise eventually. But no non-Muslim will go to paradise. Why? Because even though they committed all these good deeds, the worst sin that anybody could commit is what? To say that Allah has a partner. See, think about it. You know, okay, he smokes crack, he smokes cigarettes, he drank whiskey, he robbed banks. But to say that the creator of the heavens and the earth, to say that the creator of the heavens and the earth has a son, that's worse than anything you can do. Why? Let's just think about it. It's, it's a part of the human being's nature to feel good. That's a part of the human being's nature to want to feel good. Now, I'm not justifying getting high. Getting high is a major sin. But it's a part of the human being's nature to want to feel good. Using coke makes you feel good. Using opium, codeine, makes you feel good. Smoking a flip or whatever they call it nowadays, bogey, we used to call it back in the day. Smoke, smoking some weed, or, that's a, the white kid. Smoke, right? The white, the white, the white kids say that, right? We don't say weed. We say herb, right? Grass, not grass, right? Because every culture has their they word, right? Right? But whatever it is, smoking that dope makes you feel good. That's natural. But it's not natural to say that God has a son. Sex is natural, isn't it? Yeah, we know that. We know that. We're not talking about with your husband and wife. Sex is natural and the feeling of sex is a natural feeling. Right? Allah gave the human being that, 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 that feeling. And we should try to fulfill that feeling. Now a person says, well, I ain't got to get married. You know, he looks good. Hey, what's up? Right? But it's not natural to say that God was born. Think about what you're saying. God is born? That's not natural. That's unnatural. It's natural to want to get paid. It's natural to want to have some cash in your pocket. That's natural. Every human being has that natural inside of them to want to have some paper in their pocket, right? But it's not natural to say that God was put on a cross at the hands of somebody that he created and he couldn't even protect himself. He was put on a cross and he died. And think about it. There's a verse in the Bible that says that when Jesus was put on the cross and the Christians believe Jesus is God and the Son of God, that when Jesus was put on the cross, he said, they say he said, Ila, Ila, Lama Sabakthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why are you why are you leaving me? Is this the statement of a God? Just think about this. How can God be looking down off a cross saying, you know, the other day I was in the, I was in the airport, I bought a Newsweek magazine that had the story of Richard Pryor. Richard Pryor said, as he was sitting in his wheelchair, he said he had this dream. And we all know Richard Pryor, he's real funny, right? So he told this joke. He said, one day I was dreaming, I was sitting in my wheelchair and in this church and the Lord spoke to me. And he said, Rich? He said, yes. He said, this is the Lord. He said, yes, yes, what, what, Lord? He says, I want you to do something for me. Come a little bit closer. This is last month's Newsweek. Come a little bit closer. I have something to tell you. He said, anything, Lord, anything. He said, can you please help me down from here? Now, this is not, no, this is not to make fun. But think about, see, this joke that Richard Pryor said, this is not even funny. You know why? Because it shows the reality of how people have taken the creator of the heavens and the earth and brought him down to a lowly position. Because that statement that Richard Pryor made is exactly what Christians are saying that he said in the Bible. My God, my God, why is that forsaken me? Please, somebody help me. Now, do you think that the Muslim who commits a sin, no matter what kind of sin it is, and may he get far away from those sins, I mean, do you think that Muslim who believes correctly in Allah, though he commits a sin or she commits a sin, is going to be worse off than a person who takes their garbage out every week, every day on time, and helps the old lady across the street, but believes that God has a son is going to be better off than that person? 
You believe that God was created and born on December 25th? You think you're better than a person who drinks wine? I mean, think about this. You see that the creator of the heavens and the earth was created himself? What could be worse than that? What could be worse than saying God is born? That God, the creator, is born and he died. If he died, then who was running this universe when he was there? Who? The Holy Ghost was. You can't say the Holy Ghost was because they're all equal, remember. You can't say Jesus was doing it because remember he died. Who was running this universe? Brothers and sisters, dear listeners, if you think that God dies and he has a beginning and an end, if you think that God would die for a millisecond, not an hour, for a millisecond, then this whole universe will be destroyed because the heavens and the earth is in his hands. And if he were to die, it's over for us. So if the Muslim commits sins, and they should not commit sins, but we're human, then if he turns to his Lord and says, Oh Allah, please forgive me, and he doesn't put this brother in between himself and his Lord, saying, Oh Anwar, brother Anwar, this is brother Anwar, am I right here? Anwar, would you please, please, I'm calling on Allah through Anwar. Well, no person in their right mind is going to do that. Then what's the difference between Jesus and him? Except that Jesus was a prophet. So if that Muslim calls on Allah by himself, then Allah will forgive him. But no one will be forgiven who says that God has a partner. No one will be forgiven that says that Allah, the Creator, was born or he died or he had a mother. Just think about that. The one whom Allah created gave birth to him. All you women who have children, can you really imagine, in my conclusion, can you really imagine that the baby that came out of your womb, all that afterbirth, the placenta, all that stuff that you're going to have to eventually wash off, that beautiful bundle of joy created you. You carried that baby for a full term or maybe prematurely, nine months in your womb. What you ate, it nourished itself from what you ate. What you drank, it nourished itself from what you drank. And then when the baby comes out, it can't even defend itself. A humble little creature that can't even speak intelligibly. You saying that child is your creator? That's what you're saying when you're saying Mary gave birth to God. She had to take the baby and wash it off, but that's the same creature that created her? When did it have time to create her when it was in her womb? I mean, think about it. These concepts are foreign to the, the very logic of human beings. So that Muslim who commits a sin, may Allah forgive him. But the only way a person who is not a Muslim is going to be forgiven for their sins is that they come to Islam and they become a Muslim. That's it. Because the sin that they're committing is greater than any sin. They're not worshiping Allah. They're worshiping something that we created. And I think we don't have enough time. That's it. Time for prayer. Um, maybe we can finish the questions. The next one says, how long does it take to actually become a, a true Muslim? Okay. Well, to answer this, this is after Salah. It takes as long as it takes. A true Muslim is only known by Allah. I can't tell this brother he's a true Muslim. He can't tell me I'm a true Muslim. Allah knows who's true because I can't look in his heart. But Allah knows who's true. As for the outward appearance, that's all we can deal with. What the person does outwardly. And Allah knows that. First of all, uh, we're making the tapes uh, of this lecture, inshallah ta'ala. If uh, people want to hang around, some of the tapes will be available this evening. I've been asking the chief of the Dao or myself in Philadelphia to get copies of the tapes. Uh, real quickly, uh, Kuba Institute presents its uh, first, uh, third annual fundraising uh, banquet dinner. As for those of you who uh, attend, you know that every year we have this banquet and fundraiser. This year is going to be on Saturday, July 8th, from 6 o'clock to 10 o'clock p.m. Our guest speaker is Dr. Abdul Hakeem Jackson, formerly of Philadelphia, graduate of the University.